Being a longtime old wrestling fan, I have to confess that what's happened to Survivor Series over the years has aggravated the hell out of me. Like when you think about big four pay-per-views, this was the second one. Not SummerSlam, not Royal Rumble. Those came after Survivor Series 87. Like this was the second of the big four. I used to love how different the format was and how unique it could be. You get the heels on this one team, the baby faces on the other team. You get all types of interesting things happen, like pure craziness. And over the years, WWE's just really taken this pay-per-view for granted and treated it really poorly. And admittedly, you know, if you were to look at this show, you would think that for the most part they treated it relatively poorly, like it's a um, knockoff version of bragging rights in a lot of ways, but you're doing brand versus brand, but you're really not because you're not even keeping score. You're not really putting any stakes to anything. Nothing really matters. You're not really building up much of much heat except for a couple of matches. Like it's just really bad. And you know, Survivor Series 2020, a night of bad, some very good, but a lot of kind of conflicting emotions. Like, I love the five-on-five -five traditional tag matches, and it really pisses me off just how really, really bad these were. Like, both the men's and the women's. Like, the men's one kicked off the night. I'm sitting there more distracted by Otis looking like he just got out of a trucker night at the Blue Oyster Bar. Uh, you got AJ's out there with his version of Diesel, and yet we do nothing with that at all. Matt Riddle is still a thing, and I don't know why. Boo, 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 bitch, get out of here! Horrible. Keith Lee at least got some new theme music. And that, that sounded nice. Apparently we're calling Braun the Strowman Express now. Like, you know, that's a greater reminder of why I don't watch Raw. Um, but then we got Seth going out there and basically martyring himself so he could get paternity leave. Like, that was weird. You know, I would hope Hunter pulled him aside and said, back in my day, we would make sure we won the match, then lose our smile to get three months off. Like, that's how you really do business in the breakfast club. That's all I'm saying. Uh, but this match was really stupid. Like, it's one thing if you want to have a raw win. It's one thing if you want to make them look good. But you don't do that at the expense of your A show, which is clearly SmackDown in the ratings week over week. Support that. You don't job out SmackDown like you did here. If you want to protect guys like Keith Lee and Braun Strowman, I totally get that. And I don't disagree, and that's fine. But everything you did later in the night with Jay, with Roman, and everything else, you could have still accomplished by having them at least eliminate Matt Riddle and Sheamus and maybe AJ Styles. Thank God Big E wasn't associated with this match for SmackDown, huh? But Christ Almighty! Jay Uso gets eliminated, the guy that you just had main event, multiple pay-per-views, been main eventing multiple SmackDowns? But worthless piece of trash, Matt Riddle survives? It was absolute dog. And you know him right. And that women's match sure as hell wasn't any better. Like the first woman you choose to eliminate is Bailey, The one who was just your SmackDown Women's Champion for over a year? Instead of doing it in an interesting and compelling way where you maybe tease some type of heat between her and Bianca Belair or all the talk you had about Bailey being the captain and she's calling herself the captain like she could have screwed over Bianca something could have happened instead you did none of that and Natalya lasted longer than that match? What the hell is wrong with you, man? I get that match was sloppy, it was trash, and the whole thing with dynamic with Lana is just dumb. And there's nothing worse to me than angles that don't really have a payoff because ultimately what you're doing is wasting the fans' time. You're wasting your customers' time. And that's exactly what the hell they did here. And what really aggravates me, frankly, about both of these traditional five on five tag matches, this used to be the way that you would blow off feuds or you would start feuds or you would advance feuds. None of that really happened here. You would sit there and have somebody really get some shine and really have it be like a star-making moment. And you would have thought maybe in theory you would have at least been able to do that with Bianca Belair. But we couldn't even get that right! And the only reason that Shayna Baszler was eliminated was because she choked her out. She choked out Bianca, but she didn't let it go so she got disqualified. You're saying on the one hand that protects Shayna, sure, but on the other hand, what the hell does that do for Bianca? Like that's the one you're trying to make a star out of, isn't it? Isn't it? They say how you do it. And if you're going to do this crap with Lana being the accidental, incidental, sole survivor, fine.
the Middle East never tried to get involved to help Nia Jax or not help Nia Jax. And then when both her and Bianca get counted out, at least Lana's done something. The fact that they booked this and had the finish be that she's standing on the steel steps and that's how she becomes a sole survivor. Like, that's why you've lost millions of viewers over the past few years. It's not people cutting the cords. It's not people finding other things to do with their time. It's people remembering, oh, that's right, WWE doesn't care, so why the hell should I? Stupid. It was absolute trash. Both of these combined have to be some of the worst five-on-five -five tags that I've ever seen in Survivor Series. And as a combination, I'm trying to remember a show that had two worst. Like, this men's one was really bad, and this women's one screamed D Divas Division bullshit from seven, eight years ago. It was that bad. Like, I always wanted to come on here and be, you know, kind of positive about Bobby Lashley and Sami Zayn, but, you know, what's there to be positive about? Seriously. Like, it, here's the mindset to me of WWE. Like, you had Corey Graves, I think it was during the opening, that men's 5-on-5 uh, five -five tag match. And he was adamant. That Taker versus Diesel did not happen at WrestleMania 12. Now, here's somebody that's supposed to be a wrestling historian. You're sitting there trying to be on your kind of pompous, pretentious asshole hill. And you can't even get that basic fundamental fact right. Like, you're saying it's 11 or 13 and it wasn't 12. Yes, it was, dipshit. But it's, it's, it's the approach. It's the arrogance that they present with it. It's just, ugh. But Bobby Lashley, Sami Zayn, like, I didn't expect this to be a masterpiece. Um... Although I got to ask Michael Cole, what's so intimidating about the Hurt Business being out there together? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Is that a pigment-related statement? Hmm, hmm, hmm. With all that said, Sammy was tripped. He was tripped. Hashtag Sammy was tripped. It was dirty, MVP. You did him dirty. I don't know. Like, it was almost a match I wish wouldn't have happened, personally. But I got to see the Hurt Business. <laughs> And unlike Retribution, they actually got a pay-per-view match. Must be nice. Uh, New Day versus Street Profits was outstanding. Like, you had the Young Hungry Lions and the Street Profits showing the personality, showing, you know, what they can do. Like, it was a great showcase for them. And then the New Day, kind of a little shit-talky here, a little aggressive. Like, I really enjoyed how they were presented in this match. Like, this match was really, really good. Like, this was certainly a tag match that could hold up on any pay-per-view. And, you know, to me, it was the second best match of the night. And it wasn't that far behind the best match of the night. This was really, really good. I could have done with more of these types of matches. Because you know what you did here that you didn't have in the other 5-on-5 five -five tag matches? You actually had a little bit of friction and a little bit of heat that was manifested. So the stakes are the established guard versus the new Young Hungry Lions. You look at like Montez Ford. Evan Bourne had a long career in WWE just off of his finish alone. Montez Ward has a spectacular finish, and he's a great personality, and he can talk, like, he can get himself really over, like, he has star potential. And Angelo Dawkins, you know, a guy that's plugged away for a long time, went through a lot of different gimmicks in NXT. Crap, at the end of the day, he might get to a D-Lo Brown level, but I'll tell you what, you're looking at the real deal now! If he could be A-Lo, and he could have a D-Lo type of career, like, who would be complaining? Just saying. Um, but when you have heat, and you have... Reasons for these guys to wrestle. Like, it, it's amazing how much more we get emotionally invested. Like, that was a problem to me with Asuka and Sasha Banks. Now, the match was a little sloppy at times, and I thought the finish was kind of flat. But at least you had some type of decisive finish, and you had the right person win in Sasha Banks. She absolutely needed this defense, and she got it. Um, but it could have really used more focus on building heat in the weeks leading up to it. Because this was more about Sasha and Bailey, and then Sasha getting attacked multiple times by Carmella than it ever was really truly about Sasha and Asuka. So if you don't care about these two having heat or give a reason for these two to really care, and there are no stakes in this match at all, which I thought this match really could have used. Hey, maybe you're representing your brand, and the winner of this match, their brand gets the 30th entry or the last entry, whatever it is, in the Women's Royal Rumble match in January. Now you've got something to care about. Now you've got some type of stakes. You've got some type of purpose for something. you got none of that here. And, and again, it's just these two girls go out there and hitting some moves, and like I said, it was a little sloppy at times, so would have expected a little bit more, and could have been certainly a whole lot more if there were actually some stakes here, and they hadn't have spent so much time focusing on Sasha and Carmella when they weren't the ones wrestling here at Survivor Series. Uh, but Roman and Drew, you had heat. You had generated some friction. You had built up a reason for these two guys to fight each other, and that's why this match worked so well. 
And some of you are going to talk about, well, it took a while to get there, but man, when it did, it started to really kick some ass. You know, you got to have patience sometimes. Not every movie is going to be a ball buster from beginning to end, okay? Let the tribal chief and number two show you how they do. And God, they had to have hooked you by the end. Like, this was outstanding. And the finishing last five to ten minutes was off the hook. And I know what some of you are going to say. All of this, what happened with Jay, and he comes out. He did it on his own. Rama did not tell him to do that. He did not direct him to do that. That's Jay being Jay and trying to stray off of the island and not listen to the tribal chief yet again because his stubborn ass just doesn't learn. And I know what some of you jerkwads are going to say in the comments. Oh, here goes the like that again, making excuses. What do you call what Roman did to Drew? It was not an intentional low blow. He was just trying to point out to Jay where the ramp is, where he should be heading up, because the tribal chief doesn't need his help here. And he cannot help it if there was incidental contact with Drew's number two hole as part of that motion. This should be clearly established by now. But either way, in honor of Taker, this was certainly a night that Roman took number two, and he made him famous. Because, my God, this match was awesome. This match was great. And this match made both guys look better for it and what they're trying to do with them. And it certainly was a great performance for Drew, even in loss. Like, this is an example where the loss really doesn't matter. And you could come out better from the loss. And I think it absolutely does. And it certainly doesn't hurt Roman's character because Roman wins, LOL, as he should, as he should. So it was a great way to cap off the night of matches, even though it was certainly a mixed bag on this card. Uh, but let's be clear. The number one thing that mattered, the only thing that really, truly mattered on this night was uh, the final farewell for The Undertaker. And I'm probably going to do a separate video to truly talk about uh, my feelings about Taker and his character and this final farewell and just, you know, what it means. But it was cool to see all these guys. Like, I got to see the Godwins last night and the Godfather. And, man, Savio Vega. Like, that's a trip down memory lane if there ever has been one. You know, it's kind of weird that they brought them all out and then, you know, they had them exit the ring like, that was kind of strange, but I, I'll go with it. I'll take the nostalgia pops whenever the hell I can get them, thank you. Um, but seeing Vince McMahon out there, like, even that was kind of a startling, striking scene. Like, this is a kind of broken-looking, disheveled type of really, frankly, showing his age elderly Vince McMahon, not the spry, you know, on top of the world, King Big Dick Vince McMahon that we've been used to seeing for so many years. And you might say... Hey, well, we've seen this kind of older, broken down Vince in recent years. I agree. But I think last night really just showed just how much that was true. Nice job of him, you know, throwing in the word WWF there. That was a little pleasant surprise. I was the appropriate person to introduce Taker. And look, some of you are probably ask, asking for this big, long retirement speech. You weren't going to get that here, and nor should you have. That's not who Mark Calloway is. That's not what the Undertaker character was all about. If you're going to complain about the canned noise and the canned crowd chants and that type of shit, I'm absolutely, totally, 100% behind you. Because that sucked, and it almost ruined the moment. Um, do I wish they would have been able to do this in front of fans? Yes. Absolutely. That sucks. Uh, do I think they did a good job, all things considered? And if you're truly trying to go full circle 30 years to the date after his debut at Survivor Series 1990, then yes, it's a fitting type of send-off, and it's the right timing for it. I wish it didn't have to... Certainly be this way, but it is. And for those of us that were sitting there expecting us to be so well built up that it had to be some type of work or something, at least at the moment, apparently it's not. Like, this is legit. At least it seems that way until the next time Saudis, Saudi Arabia throws a bunch of money at it. But it's just weird. Like, it's hard to express sometimes, like, how much people that you've never met, probably never will meet, how much they've meant to you and how much they have impacted your life. And I think beyond question, like, last night watching Survivor Series, I, I felt another piece of my childhood die. Like, so many memories associated with my life and my time as a wrestling fan are tied up in The Undertaker. 
And now it's like I'm officially closing the page on that chapter of my life. That's a hard feeling, man. It really, truly is. You know, I appreciate that he was kind of short, sweet, and to the point with what he said because I thought it was perfect for him and who he was and what that character at its best has always been about. I didn't want to hear a 20-minute retirement speech from him. Like, that was fitting. That was appropriate. It was damn near perfect. There are other parts about it I didn't like so much, yes, but I can deal with that. Um, I wish it didn't have to be like this, but apparently it does. But yeah, it's almost kind of surreal at this point. Because yeah, you've been thinking it's going to happen for so many years and then it never does. Now it seems like it might have actually happened. Like, you just don't want to believe it or you just don't believe it. Yeah, it's like a, it's a somber, sobering reality right now. But the Undertaker has retired. Something you felt was an eventuality, but you never knew exactly when it would actually become a reality. This is crazy, man. And I'm so glad this happened at the end of the show. I'm sure this was their plan all along because it had to be, because nothing else could have followed this. Nothing. Interesting, man. So yeah, I'll, I'll do more deep diving in a separate video talking about this uh, final farewell for The Undertaker, but I guess for now the best thing I could say is Farewell Taker, thank you for everything. Appreciate it all. See you guys.